Good morning. Today's video is going to be a little bit different than our other forensic chemistry videos. This one is not about investigation and detecting uh, the uh, parts of a crime or evidence in a crime that's been committed in the past, although this may be part of that. Um, this is more about preemption, detecting and disrupting a future threat. And so your same background in forensic chemistry would allow you to work in this field too of security operations. And we're also going to focus on gas phase detection techniques today. And so we want to talk about the role of security operations. Of course, the goal is to reduce threats with the three Ds. That is the de detection of threats and threatening events and supporting infrastructure. Uh, disrupting those threatening events and the supporting infrastructure and then also destroying those threats, neutralizing the threat and supporting those environments that are destroying those supportive environments for these threats. Because what we don't want to do is to um, just protect ourselves to the point where we let these threats go unanswered and we have to live our lives like we are now with the coronavirus uh, wearing PPE all the time. So it is a secondary goal to have a minimal impact on normal life, but all of these threats, if carried out, will have a dramatic impact on normal life. So what is a threat? Well, a threat is a combination of things. It's not just intent. So, you know, a little child can say, I'm going to beat you up, but you know that the little child is not going to have the capability to beat you up. It's the threat is an intent plus a capability. And so you have to have the intent to cause harm uh, to you or your neighbors, businesses, cities, maybe even the state or a country. And these are potential persons that might have uh, intent, like personal enemies, ex-friends, uh, business competitors, disgruntled ex-employees, or other governments even at a nation, national level, uh, and domestic and international terrorists. So these folks may have intent to cause harm, but do they have the capability to cause harm? So you need to have an analysis of both of those things. The uh, capability to cause harm is really uh, one of the areas where forensic science or the scientific community comes into play. Uh, there are lots of capabilities to harm a single person, but fewer capabilities exist to harm large groups and fewer still to harm whole countries. Although economic harm can result fairly easily, uh, we're mostly talking here about uh, physical harm, threats to life and, and, uh, and health. And so what makes an attractive target? Well, if you have the intent to cause substantial harm, you'd be looking for large numbers of victims uh, confined to an area so they would minimize escape, um, controlled and predictable environments, a highly symbolic target, preferably something that has media coverage, a large potential for media exposure, and then soft security. It's either low security or easily defeated security. And so this describes a lot of our sporting events, business buildings, air travel, and mass transit. Although we're seeing the, the response of the security community is to make these targets less soft so they'll have metal detectors and other kinds of detection techniques. Um, still, these are the areas where we're most vulnerable as a society. And so let's talk about the different capabilities to cause harm. So one of the possibilities is a chemical attack. And so let's look at some of the possible chemical agents that might be uh, attractive for someone who wanted to cause a lot of harm to a large uh, group of people. And so we have chemical warfare agents. These are typically organophosphate nerve agents. You've heard these different names, sarin and cyclosarin and so on, VX nerve gas. What these do is these irreversibly inactivate acetylcholine esterase, producing a toxic accumulation of acetylcholine. Now acetylcholine is a, a neurotransmitter, and so it's what your nerves use to fire your muscles. And if they, they send out the signal, causes a muscle to contract, and then acetylcholine esterase turns off that signal. Well, if you inhibit the turning off of that signal, then all of your muscles are turned on and they, they um, can't be stopped. So they contract and contract, and so you basically convulse yourself to death. And so that would be what these nerve agents do. There are other kinds of agents called vesicants, 
and these are mustard gases or blister agents. And what these do is have a, a terrible reaction with the skin and they cause a uh, rapid and um, terrible blisters that grow up under the skin and these fill with a fluid like blisters do and then they burst. Um, now people have survived the, the blister agents um, but what happens typically is that once the blisters pop open then they get secondary infections and so these were dr dramatically terrible during the First World War where the unsanitary conditions of trench warfare, the blister agents the, would cause secondary infections and they would die from septic shock. But the advantage of the security operator in these situations is these uh, chemical warfare agents are very volatile. And so vapor detectors are easily able to detect them at below toxic levels. Let's talk about something that may be a little easier to come by, and those would be toxic industrial chemicals, or TICS or TICS. Uh, these are much easier to obtain. You see large tanks of these driving down the highway occasionally, and so you can see that, um, you know, you can see here on this tanker, my little pointer will work. Let's see what's wrong with this thing. Well, I'm not sure what is going on with it, but you can see over here this truck is labeled as anhydrous ammonia. This is the Department of Transportation uh, logo, and you can see with these numbers here, this is a communication to emergency response personnel as to what's in this tank. And so if you know the number on the tank, you can look this up on the, uh, text or the, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation website and see what that uh, substance is. But they also have many of these labeled and this one's labeled as anhydrous ammonia. Now this is toxic enough to kill if the dose is high, but <clears throat> if you were to try to sneak ammonia or anhydrous ammonia onto an airplane or into a sporting event, uh, it would be too conspicuous for, for enormous quantities. And so uh, the problem with any kind of gaseous release is because gases typically dilute in the atmosphere. And so you need a really constant. You need to maintain the concentration at a high level to make it toxic. But as you disperse it into a crowd, the concentration drops quickly down to the less than toxic level. So these are luckily for for us and society. These are not very easy to use and don't cause a, a enormous damage uh, without sophistication. You need a sophisticated delivery mechanism, and the more sophistication that goes into the delivery mechanism, the more likely it is to be detected. Now, one other option is high explosives, uh, also known as plastic explosives. Now, this is an, an older um, example of a terrorist attack. It was back in 1988, but it was one of the first aircraft bombings. And the reason I want to highlight this one is because of the physical evidence, because that's our, our section of notes that we're in right now in the forensic chemistry is to think about the physical uh, evidence that's left behind in, a, in an event like this. So this would be a forensic investigation example and like I said earlier the forensic side of things is trying to detect what happened in the past and so this is uh, not acceptable for security operations because 243 passengers, 16 crew members and 11 Scotland residents died and then we're investigating what happened. So those people have already died. For security operations, we want to detect these things before anyone dies. And so that's the difference between security and forensics. But you use the same knowledge and the same skills. So notice that this plane, this enormous plane, was brought down by only 16 ounces of explosives. That's one pound of plastic explosives. So not very much at all. And so let's look at the investigation of the physical evidence. More than 10,000 pieces of debris were retrieved, tagged, and tracked. And typically what they'll do is they'll rent a hangar and they'll bring every piece back to the hangar and they will, like a puzzle, put it back together. Now they can't construct the whole airplane back together because it's been ripped apart by the crash. But they can put the wings where the wings go and all those fragments and they can put the fuselage in somewhat of the same order and location that they had on the plane before it was blown up. And so this is uh, 
quite an a enormous endeavor to reconstruct what happened, especially in an airplane crash. And so the fuselage, when they pieced it sort of back together in terms of this puzzle, they found a 20-inch blast hole in the forward cargo hold. An examination of the baggage containers that they recovered revealed high energy damage, so this looked like an explosive. Then they tested explosives. They found the type of luggage that it was, and they put in you know, small amounts of explosive and blew it up. They put in large amounts of explosives and blew it up, and they realized that it was a small amount of explosives, roughly a pound of explosives. Then they discovered that uh, there were pieces of circuit board in this Samsonite suitcase that was believed to contain the bomb. And the pieces of the circuit board, when they were an analyzed, were identified to be part of a little, um, like a Sony Walkman, or a Toshiba Bombi radio cassette player. So like a little cassette player that's about that big, containing a, a pound of explosives, brought down Pan Am Fly 103. This um, also tied into other forensic investigations that they had of this Palestinian terror group uh, because they, they found a similar cassette player being used to conceal a Semtex bomb and it was uh, seized by West German police. This also found, there was a circuit board fragment found embedded in a piece of charred material and that was identified as part of an electronic timer similar to that found on a Libyan intelligence agent that had been arrested about 10 months previously. And this timer was traced back through the Swiss manufacturer to the Libyan army. So we had a connection to Libya. We had a couple of other examples of a cassette player being used as a bomb. And then uh, this piece was found also in a Samsonite suitcase that was on this flight. The investigators also found that an unaccompanied bag had been routed onto this flight from uh, Frankfurt onto this feeder flight into Heathrow. And so this really tied everything together. And no notice some of the things that I've put in red here. Uh, we've got this interlined baggage system that is able to track every bag from every flight to every other flight. Oh, when we find a, a, a circuit board fragment, we can look at the traces on that circuit board, we can look at the patterns, we can search through what's called Gerber data files, and we can find those different kinds of circuit boards and their manufacturers, even the lot number and the, the date of manufacture a lot of times. Uh, same thing with the circuit board tying it to a cassette player made by Toshiba. Uh, there's a lot of physical evidence left behind after a bomb explodes and you can find those pieces of physical evidence that will tie you back to the, to the um, mechanisms of the crime. Now, in terms of forensic indicators of an upcoming threat, what are the things that we can look for? Well, the, one of the most um, easily detected uh, signatures for a bomb or some sort of disruptive, uh, um, disruptive device is that it must have a volatile component that we can smell with our detectors. And so chemical warfare agents or toxic industrial chemicals are, are volatile. And so any kind of gas phase detection technique is going to be able to detect them. Explosives also indicate a threat because they're not approved for civilian use or carry or possession. And so how might explosives be detected? Let's look a little bit at what explosives are and how explosive devices operate. Now, the previous video, video shows the different types of explosives. And so let me just talk a little bit in this video about um, explosive charges. <clears throat> explosives must be safe to be useful. And so sensitive primary explosives, here these mercury, mercury fulminate or lead stiffenate, uh, lead stiffenate is in, in gun uh, ammunition the primers. Uh, it's in very small quantities and it's sensitive to shock. That's what actually makes the, the bullet fire, is that there's a mechanical shock. The firing pin impacts the primer and sets the lead stiffenate off. And then that lead stiffenate lights the gunpowder, which is actually not an explosive. It's a, it's a propellant. Uh, 
it burns quickly and that gas that's generated propels the bullet through the barrel but because these are so shock sensitive they're very not very useful for explosive devices because they tend to blow up the bomb maker rather than the person the bomb maker wants to hurt and so these secondary explosives um, they're less sensitive we still classify them as sensitive but they're not very sensitive and so PETN is probably one of the most common detonator explosives. And so these secondary explosives are less sensitive to detonation by dropping or static charge or friction, but you can still set them off with a large electrical current, um, a large burst of heat, or a, um, a, what they call a slapper or exploding bridge wire uh, detonator. And we use the drop hammer technique to rank the sensitivity. And so you can see the different amounts of impact that these um, explosives need before they can be set off. And so the, <clears throat> the very sensitive techniques, this is essentially a one kilogram weight lifted a meter off the ground and it hits that explosive or two meters off the ground, hits that explosive and it goes off. Uh, this is nitroglycerin, extremely sensitive, a one kilogram mass lifted about 20 centimeters up falling on that explosive will be enough to set off the nitroglycerin. You see PETN and HMX and RDX um, have a little higher drop hammer and then up here TATB, that's triamino trinitrobenzene, benzene, has a drop hammer of 50 or even more than 50. And ammonium nitrate, which is fertilizer, also has a very insensitive. Essentially these need an explosive to be set off. So that's what sets up the difficulty for a safe explosive, you need a, an insensitive explosive. So users of explosives would like to only use insensitive explosives, but these can't be detonated independently. An explosive train is needed for detonation. Therefore, practical main charges must contain some sensitive, and luckily for us, the forensic scientists, these sensitive explosives are also volatile. That means we can detect them. And so we need some sort of initiation event, an impact or a stab like a firing pin hitting that primary explosive, or electrical current or heat like an electrical match. That, that causes the primary charge to start to burn and then burn vigorously, which is called deflagration. And then when the shock wave passes the speed of sound, it becomes a detonation. And then that detonation feeds into a, a secondary or main charge which is made of insensitive explosives. And that's the large explosive that becomes uh, detonated. Uh, the Timothy McVeigh bombing of the um, Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City also used this kind of technique. He had a primary charge of some detonators that fed into the aluminum, the ammonium nitrate fuel oil canisters that he had in the back of a Ryder truck. Those were, you know, close to a ton in size, but the primary charges that he had were just a few grams in size and those were volatile and those could have been sniffed if someone were able to inspect that truck before um, it was set off and so this is the I guess the Achilles heel to these large disruptive explosive devices is to clue in on these volatile components so that they can be detected and that you can disrupt the uh, activities of the person who's making the threat. There's other ways to detect these explosives. Um, there's imaging techniques like x-ray and terahertz, but they don't really detect the explosives themselves. They detect the density of the main charges and the, the initiation circuitry, batteries, wires, um, what we call the fire set. Um, these are typically used as flags for further inspection. And now they've been approved for semi-remote screening. So here's a picture of an airport. They're, they're imaging the people waiting in line, pr probably without their knowledge. And you see this person is concealing something under their shirt. And so you see this dark patch, and that's the density change that we're measuring. So the person's clothing is not very dense, but there is something under this person's clothing that is dense. The reflective area is essentially the water in the body. So this technique like terahertz spectroscopy sends a terahertz wave <clears throat> to the body and it bounces off the water in the body. 
And if there's anything in there that absorbs that terahertz uh, energy, uh, then it shows up as a dark region. And so the, the clothing absorbs very little because it's not very dense. But whatever this person is concealing is, is more dense than clothing. And so it shows up as a dark patch. And so then security knows to pull this person aside and to inspect a little further to see what that is. It may be an ID pouch. It may be um, a Camelback water bag or something. I don't know. It could be maybe a colostomy bag um, if this person has had surgery and has a colostomy bag. But we don't know what it is. We just see that there's a density change and that requires further inspection. Explosives can be detected by canines as well. And so uh, this is such a cute picture, I had to put it in. So here's a little baby pup who's entering into the canine team program. Of course, we can train the sniffer dog to sniff explosives, but uh, we can, we've trained dogs to also sniff for money, for drug transfers and so on, for cash uh, being taken on, on planes. Uh, dogs can be trained to sniff whatever you want them to sniff, essentially. Uh, but uh, we also have instrumentation, GCMS, multi-pass IR, tunable laser diode absorption spectroscopy. We have terahertz spectroscopy, not just imaging. And then we have other adsorptive techniques and ion mobility spectrometry. So let's talk about these different techniques that we can be used, that can be used to detect volatile compounds. So this tunable diode laser absorption spectroscopy is extremely sensitive but it's uh, very expensive. And because it's so sensitive, uh, it, may, it may only detect certain types of explosives. Now, it would be great, you could tune this to detect only PETN, but then it might miss nitroglycerin, or it might miss beta HMX. Um, it may be too selective, and it's also expensive. And so you need to make sure that, that it matches the profile of what, you're, what you are likely to find. Otherwise, you're going to miss something. We have GCMS. It is a gold standard for detecting and, and reporting uh, what the explosives are. But it's too slow because it is a separation technique. It takes a while to run. So it's not a very good screening technique. It's the gold standard for forensic analysis, though. Long path IR is very selective but it's also less sensitive. Now, long path IR, you take an infrared beam and you bounce it between two mirrors. And so it has a very long path, and we know that the absorption is proportional to the path length of a detection cell. And so some of these can have, you know, 90 to 100 reflections between two mirrors. And so you can get like 10 meter path lengths, uh, but it's pretty slow and it's still not very sensitive. The terahertz spectroscopy is in its infancy. We're getting better. We have more terahertz um, emitters now and detectors. But in terms of uh, the, the hardware on doing dispersive terahertz spectroscopy, it's still uh, not, I guess, ready for implementation. The dogs are great, but they're expensive for training and they can't be easily mass produced. You know, if we find a piece of equipment or instrumentation that is perfect and can outperform dogs, then we can mass produce that. And uh, the, with mass production, down comes the cost. We also have adsorptive techniques where the explosive molecules stick to a surface and then we use that surface, some change in that surface to detect. Uh, we can use conductive polymers and we can treat those with explosives and then desorb the explosives and so there's an electrical change when the, the explosive lands in that little pocket and and these are great and very selective but because they're so selective you need to make an individual detector for every type of explosive and so a range of detection is going to be expensive essentially you have to make a complete instrument for every different type of explosive and then finally, we have this ion mobility spectrometry. It has the benefits of mass spectrometry and chromatography, and it's inexpensive. Uh, it was developed years ago for the US Army to detect chemical weapons. And it was used by the Coast Guard to detect narcotics. And it's now used in almost all airports worldwide. So let's go into more detail on ion mobility spectrometry. Here we have the 
internal workings of an ion scan, uh, ion mobility spectrometer. This is just one particular type. What you do if you've been to the airport, you see they, they wipe down your luggage with this little sample cloth and they put it in the instrument here. This is an example here. They put it under that little plate and press it down. Well, that's a desorber. It heats up this little spot in the sample cloth. And if you have uh, volatile explosives on that sample cloth that rubbed off of your luggage or off your hands or off of your shoes, then it's going to go into the instrument. It'll go into the inlet and be ionized here in the ionization cell. So let's zoom in on this part of the part of the spectrometer. So here we have three explosives that came off of someone's luggage <clears throat> and they're in the ionization chamber. This is actually uh, both a cost saving measure and a size saving measure. These instruments have a radioactive source that emits beta particles. Now you may remember from instrumental analysis we had um, different ways to create ions in the mass spectrometer. So gas chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. The gases come out the end and they go into the mass spec and they're ionized in some way. And a lot of times they use electron impact ionization. Well this is a similar technique without the high voltage power supply. So we've eliminated the high voltage power supply and put in a radioactive source that produces beta particles, which are high energy electrons. In actuality, these high energy electrons uh, will ionize a reactant gas. Typically it's methylene chloride. And so you have methylene chloride ions in there and your other molecules come in and they are ionized by the methylene chloride. But for simplicity, I just show the beta particles ionizing the explosive molecules. Now once these explosive molecules become charged, they see the detector down here. And you see the detector is positively charged and these uh, explosive molecules are negatively charged and so they're naturally attracted to the detector. Well they would just all fly to the detector in mass and very quickly if we didn't have this counter flow of air. So we have dry air flowing against these molecules and that slows them down and causes them to separate. So instead of chromatography which has a stationary phase, this is more like trying to go um, opposite uh, of the flow in a crowded hallway. Uh, there's no stationary phase. You're moving forward because you have an agenda and these molecules are trying to get to the detector because they're charged. And you have these neutral molecules going opposite of you and bouncing you around and slowing you down. And so this gate grid pulses and the ions down the drift tube and they flow through this counter flow of dry air or nitrogen and the explosives are typically negative and so they're going towards a positive detector. If you were to try to detect narcotics you would just make the detector negative and it would still work. And so then the ion separation is based upon this unique combination of molecular size and mass to charge ratio. So that mass to charge ratio is sort of the, the acceleration they have on on these molecules and pulling them down this drift tube. And these coils here just keep the ions focused in the middle. So they kind of create a funnel that ends on the detector. So they're going to stay in that electrical funnel. They're going to bounce along with air and it's going to separate them. And it's pretty fast. If you notice here, here's a full scan and this is in milliseconds. So this is 25 milliseconds. Compare that to a gas chroma chromatographic run that takes minutes, uh, sometimes up to 15 minutes um, for a good separation of these types of explosives. So we can do this in just milliseconds. So the ions impact the electron capture detector and a plot of the detector signal is called the plasmagram and the separation is very fast. So this is an example of a plasmagram and this is the calibration signal. And so if you don't have anything in the inlet and you pull the signal that the detector is getting all of the time, this is the calibration gas, that methylene chloride. This also serves as a validation of the technique because if you can see the calibration gas then you can also tell that the detector is working, the counterflow is working, the ionization is working, the, the uh, ionization gas is present. So this is a great uh, validation of the technique and then you can insert some standards to check to see if it's performing against the explosives. So here's an example. 
of the change in the plasmagram when a particular molecule is placed in there, or a set of molecules actually. So you see the, the uh, reactant gas is the, the first segment. These are different things called segments. You see a quick species shows up here and then goes away, and then this other species is detected for a quite a long time. So each one of these is 15 milliseconds, and then the next 15 milliseconds, and then the next 15 milliseconds. So it just keeps sweeping this frequency. So it opens the gate grid, and the molecules flow down. And then it opens the gate grid again, and the molecules flow down. So each one of these is a different scan. And so if we could monitor, monitor these, this is a particular width of a channel, say at 11 milliseconds. So each sort of millisecond time slot is a different channel, and the explosives will show up in, in the same channel uh, according to their size and charge. And so here's the detection alarm parameters. And these were edited to detect these different kinds of molecules, like dinitrotoluene. You've heard of trinitrotoluene. But dinitrotoluene is an impurity in trinitrotoluene, and dinitrotoluene is like three to five times more volatile than TNT. And so it's going to show up more frequently than TNT because it's more volatile. So if you might have a large main charge of trinitrotoluene, but the impurity of DNT might be the thing that you detect. There's different forms of HMX that you can detect, a nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin TNT mixed, uh, nitrates, and so on. So these are different types of explosives. These would be the, the uh, drift times that you would use to detect them. You've got some uncertainties associated with it. And so if a particular drift time, plus or minus some um, variability in this column, shows up with a full width at half maximum that meets, meets this uh, criterion, and shows up in the in two or more consecutive segments, which means it wasn't just a glitch, then you can ring the bell and call the cops because you've detected that explosive. And so this is a way that we can detect uh, larger main charges or the volatile um, detect, uh, detonator explosives. Um, at this point, this is kind of, kind of the state of the art for detection. Uh, we can use this more in the security area than the forensic science area because this is about detecting the threat before it's carried out. So we want to detect, disrupt, and destroy the capability of taking that intent to cause harm. And so these are some parting thoughts. You know, a pilot once described flying as hours of boredom interrupted by seconds of terror. They also describe a successful landing as one you can walk away from. Well, the field of forensic science has been in the terrorist era since 9-11. And that's characterized as it has been with years of boredom interrupted by days of terror. And many of these things we haven't seen in the public eye, but have been behind the scenes as uh, the forensic scientists in coordination with security operations have stopped some of these attacks. Uh, using the instrumentation, the techniques, and the evidence uh, that you guys are already versed in as a result of your degree. And so as a forensic chemistry major, the world is depending upon you to detect, disrupt, and destroy these threats uh, so that in the days ahead, these days of terror will be rare. And so that's a little rundown on how your degree may apply in security operations. I hope you enjoyed it.